to the Dowie Experts Series podcast. I'm Robert Coons. Today is our interview with Peter Ralston. Peter is a internationally renowned martial artist and master of consciousness and ontology work who founded the arts of Chengxin. Peter is well known for having been the first non-Asian person to win a full contact martial arts tournament in Taiwan in the 1970s. Currently, he lives in Pipe Creek, Texas, where he hosts retreats and seminars every year in the arts of ontology, consciousness, and martial arts. I have a personal interest in Peter's work because in the early days of my internal martial arts career, I studied with him on more than one occasion at his retreat in Texas. Peter is an insightful and wonderful teacher who has decades of teaching experience, and his books, videos, and seminars are definitely worth checking out. Without any further ado, I present Peter Ralston. I'm very, very pleased to have you here, Peter. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So um, just to get a little warm up for, for the viewers, I'm wondering if you can give us a bit of the background about uh, yourself and what Changshin is. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's start with a real simple question. Uh, <laughs> um, myself. Well, let's see. Kind of the sweeping overview here for your listeners would be, I grew up in Singapore as a child and then Tokyo as a teenager. And then I spent my 20s some of my 30s in San Francisco Chinatown in a basement and started studying martial arts when I was in Singapore as a child and studied throughout, studied for decades and decades and decades and decades. And what I did was I studied everything. <clears throat> you know, I did judo and jujitsu. I did karate, not a very good art, but I did it when I was a teenager and then, you know, realized, okay, this is limited did Gong Fu before Gong Fu was even known by people. Uh, yeah, that's a long story. Anyway, and, um, you know, and I got into Taiji and Aikido and Shingi and Bakwa, you know, and the internal martial arts and stuff like that. And um, I did pretty much every martial art known to humans. There's a couple I didn't do, which is, uh, so it's easier to just say everything I, you know, I, I didn't do than what I did do. Um, pretty much I did everything and I got, you know, black belts or could beat up everybody or whatever. I did boxing, I did fencing, et cetera, et cetera. So I was into the martial arts for many, many decades, many, many decades. And I trained very hard. Um, I trained eight, 10 hours a day, every day, uh, for decades because you know, I had a lot to do. <laughs> and, um, I got more and more into uh, mastering the arts, but also started to grasp that, wait a minute, I've done this art, this art, this art, and every art says it's the best art. And really started to grasp that the reason it says it's the best art is because it's the art you're doing. <laughs> you know, it's the art that people are doing. Um, so it can't be true. It can't be that every art is the best art. And of course, you know, then we say, well, yeah, but my art's the best art. No, probably not. And anyway, as I started to, to look into it, I also started to notice, you know, I learned the traditions from everybody. I learned all the traditions, the techniques, the, the sets, the, you know, the ideas, whatever, I, fighting, if there was, if it was a, a appropriate, push hands, whatever it was, uh, I did it. And um, I started to realize it was too limited, that every tradition was too limited because every tradition tends to be myopic. It tends to be founded on a belief system. I'm sorry that, you know, probably a lot of your uh, viewers are going to take umbrage with things I'm going to say, but that's a, you know, hey, I'm an old man now, I don't care. So in any case, they're all too focused on a, a belief system. And most of the time, the belief system is a tradition handed down or somebody, some, you know, make something up, whatever, it's just often useless. Um, it's not founded on what's real and or what's effective. Now, uh, we can get in a long story of what's effective, but as you know, as you've 
said, I also got into this consciousness work, the kind of Zen domain, when I was very young, when I was 21. And um, I did a lot of work before that with mind and everything and had some really break, great breakthroughs and insights, like in judo, for example, that just totally turned the whole thing around. You know, it. I went from being uh, a pedestrian, uh, white belt, green belt, and then pretty much overnight, just slammed through everything else to, you know, into the black belts and stuff, and was better than anybody else at the dojo. Why? Well, not because I was physically more able, you see, but because I understood what they didn't understand, you see. I understood I could experience the principles involved and take advantage of that. And, you know, anyway, that made a big, big, big difference. And so by the time I got into Zen, so I was a real fan of kind of contemplation, looking into things, questioning. And so I did that and had some real success there, what Zen people call enlightenment experiences. And then uh, that really made a difference in my martial work. So I started picking it apart and being freed from traditions, being freed from belief systems, being freed from, and I deliberately did that too. You know, like I went after my beliefs. I realized that beliefs are just beliefs. They're not the truth. We think they're the truth, okay? but they're not the truth. They're just a concept, an idea that we have or have heard, you know, have adopted that says it's true, but that's just a belief. And so I threw out deliberately all belief systems and started to, and it took a couple, couple, three years before I, you know, massive and still would find stuff later. But anyway, just threw it out, threw it out, threw it out and started working from the ground up. What is fighting? Because I was interested in fighting. I wasn't interested in a tradition, you know, an art that was handed down. I, I did those. I was very good at them. But I was interested in what the real skill is, mastery of uh, fighting arts. And so I did from the ground up. That's where the body being that you mentioned came from. It's like, what's the most effective and effortless way to uh, use the body? and effortless power, which is something I created. And, um, you know, and then fighting, what's really involved? Not just what a, what's a teacher tell me, you say? Not just a tradition of like, do this and slap that and tickle the other thing, you know, whatever. Not do this technique or that technique. Yeah, it's all fine. You know, it's, it's useful to know some things or these things, but what is it? It's another person you're having a relationship with and you stand across from them or sit across from them if you're sitting <laughs> anyway and like what's involved their mind your mind their body your body force momentum balance power etc strategy and how you interact so what is all that so i started really working on it working on it working on it and that's where cheng shin came from you see because you asked about cheng shin and cheng shin is not an art really uh there is we have an art of effortless power we call, that's an art uh it's like we have the the body being material so we have the consciousness work and stuff like that but change in itself just means basically the true nature and so it's just a, something i grabbed to, to to tack on to the fact that i wasn't doing what i was taught anymore that what was really powerful what was really uh made me skillful was what i discovered what I uh, uh, did a lot, a lot, a lot of work on. There's certainly a lot, a lot, a lot of training that happened in all of the arts that I did. But it's what I discovered, the insights I had, the breakthroughs I made that made me skillful. You know, the principles I discovered. And so I started teaching that. And since I didn't learn that from anybody, uh, I had, a, you know, a new name. So came up with a new name. And so the, the purpose, the focus of what I do in that domain or what I did, I'm getting pretty old now, <laughs> but what I do in that domain is to get at the truth of what's really happening and what skill really is, et cetera, you know? And uh, so, you know, we do that. So that's the, that's the basic wrap. How's that? Excellent. So there were two things that I picked up on immediately. One of the things is that what you do is, I, if I understand correctly, is based on discovering principles. And so the first question that I have relative to that is what it means to to discover a principle and what it means to uh, enact a principle in practice relative to 
either physical or cognitive activity. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, no, it's a it's a long story, of course. And you know, I kind of the, the body of knowledge and all the stuff we're going to takes, well, a lot of time, right? So I'll just try to uh, give something useful here. Um, let me see. When when I was a teenager, late teenager, and I was doing judo, a lot of judo and, and other stuff too, but I was doing uh, mostly judo. And I didn't have enough time in the dojo. I didn't have enough time to train in my mind. So yeah, I was obsessive. And so uh, I would sit in the alcove in my house and dwell on techniques, for example. You know, I was trying to learn a technique. This is when I was still like white belt, green belt, you know. And I was trying to learn a technique and I'd, I'd work on it with my mind. And I realized, and I'm, I'm telling you this story to help ground it because people have a hard time usually grasping how to get out of principle. So, and I was working out with my mind, like, okay, do the technique over and over again. Now I'd, I'd try the technique in my mind, like most people would do it. And they just, you know, they're successful. Why? Because it's in your mind. <laughs> and so you just do it, see? But then I go back to the school and I couldn't do it. So something was missing, something important was missing. And so pretty quickly, I started to, to realize if I'm going to train this in any useful way, I have to recreate the exact reality that I'm going to deal with. In other words, the person's weight, their body, you know, they have two legs, two arms, etc. The sweat on their face, they get, whatever it is, you see, it's like their balance, everything, their reactivity. And so as I started to recreate the whole reality in my mind of that training domain, then I would try the technique and fail. Why? Because, you know, I'd fail at the dojo. <laughs> See, and I'd try again and try again and try again. See, and in my mind, you can do that pretty quick because you don't have to keep standing up. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I keep trying and then alter what I'm doing. See, alter the distance of the chains, the angle, whatever. You See, attitude, whatever it is. And I kept doing that until finally, bingo, there's the technique. I can get it. See, and I knew I could get it because I could fail. And I was failing the whole time. You see how unusual that is. See, most people don't know that's even accessible to them. Now, in any case, since I would fail and then I would have success, I had a pretty good idea that the success meant something. And it did, because when I go back to the dojo, bingo, I would do the technique, it worked perfectly. And so I kept doing that and I kept doing that. So I started learning in this way and I kept, you know, technique after technique. But pretty soon, now we're getting to the principal part here. So, you know, pretty soon, for some reason, I guess, I don't know what, I don't know, I sort of like opened up and made a leap, an insight, kind of like a little judo enlightenment, you see? And all of a sudden, because of the work I had done, you know, in my mind and the work I had done, it was so successful with all these techniques that I did, I got the whole thing. I got, oh, this is the principle of judo. I get it. And it's supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be a struggle and a strain. You know what I'm saying? It's supposed to be easy. And I got, oh, I got it. And then the moment I got that, remember, I was still the green belt. And the moment I got that, that was a genuine experiential insight. It was not an idea. It was not just a good concept. It was real insight. And why do I know it's a real insight? Because I went back to the dojo and cleaned up. I went back and then boom, 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 boom. I went through technique after technique after technique. See, because I could apply this principle that I grasped of how the whole thing is supposed to work, how it really works well to every technique. And within uh, the same amount of time, pretty much it took me to become you know, a green belt, I became a black belt. And nobody had ever done that at the school. And as a matter of fact, I was kind of slowed down by the older guys in front of me who hadn't got their black belt. And, Teacher couldn't promote them, so I helped them <laughs> move along so that you know I could get to it. But in any case, so the power was remarkable. That's the power of the principle. I'm trying to get the grounded sense across, you see, of the power of the principle. It is not just an idea. It's certainly not a fantasy. It's something real. If it's not, it's not the principle. So like, for example, we have the, a principle we learn about called gravity. And you can see that everything you do is relating to the principle of gravity. 
Now, if you want to be, and you had you had to do that, you know, when you learned to stand up and walk as a baby, you had to relate to the principle of gravity. Otherwise, you did not stand up and walk. See? And you did. You learned how to do that. And most of it is done, you know, unconsciously. You didn't know what you were doing. You didn't know what gravity was, but you knew the demands that were acting upon you. And so you started to get good at that. But if you want, say you wanted to get better and you wanted to, um, you know, master tightrope walking, for example, you need a lot better handle on gravity. And so you have to study it and you have to grasp really what's going on here and align to that principle. And you know that if you mess up, you're going to pay the consequences. So it is also in a martial domain. You have principles like we have principles like leading or borrowing or joining or other principles, et cetera, you know, that, you know, that when you align with them, when you're actually doing them, when you know how to do them, and when you can translate them broadly into any interaction, whether it's a martial interaction, which is what, what the concern might be here, or speaking or business or whatever, when you can actually apply the principle in action, it works. It has to work because it's a principle that demands certain results. So that means when these actions are taken, this relationship is created. Like when you're leading somebody, they will be led. Why? Because that's what the principle demands. You say, if you're not leading them, then you're not leading them, et cetera. You know, and you turn that to your advantage, blah, blah. When you're joining somebody, your whole mind, your whole disposition, your body, your physical uh, motion and activity like, has to join them. And you have to join them in a deep way. You can't just do this like an idea of joining. You have to get inside their body. You have to like inside your body, inside their body, inside mind, et cetera. And you join the whole thing. Anyway, anyway, I go on. And it makes a huge difference, you see. Um, in any case, uh, these are principles we adopt. They're not demanded of us like gravity, you see. <laughs> gravity kind of comes with the package of the planet here. But, you know, joining, leading, borrowing, that, they don't come. We, we have to learn them and then we have to understand them. And once we do, we can incorporate them and do them. Then it makes a huge difference in our abilities and our skill level. So how's that? Excellent. And so when when I had previously been thinking about principles, I think that I had radically misunderstood something very deep about them. And from from what you just said, um, I got the sense that there's a there are processes that you can undertake to discover a principle, which would relate to um, your past experience, how you structure your cognitive environment, and then how you work on uh, applying that in testing of whatever kind of skill you're trying to work on. Um, and so relative to that, then how does that interface with how we understand, let's say, our experience in relation to an activity that we're doing? Because an experience is another topic that you talk about in a lot of detail. And it seems like there's this is something that I that I think a lot of people find really difficult, especially if they study, let's say, meditation. Then they'll look at uh, the principles of practice as something that they apply right away in order to have an experience. But if I read what you what you've been saying over the years correctly, it seems like you might reverse engineer that, where you would say, uh, through your experience, you try to actually figure out what the principle is so that you can feed back into it. Is that does that make sense? Yeah, um, sure. That's it, it's in the ballpark. Now, let's consider. First of all, yes, you might try to you know intellectually grasp the principle. That, that's fine. You know, you get ideas, etc. Like that it's not enough at all. It won't change your actions or your experience. Really, not much. Um, you know, and then figure it out, et cetera, et cetera. But at some point, and in, 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 in test and experience, and like look for it, all that. You do a lot of work, but at some point you actually grasp the principle and that usually happens suddenly. You know, it's not like slowly you get a little bit and then a little bit more, a little bit more. No, no, the principle is the principle. And so when you grasp it, then you can do it. Now you can get better and better and better at doing it, see? But you have to grasp it first. So there is that kind of sudden usual insight into the principle and it's experiential. Now you ask about experience. Now, we're talking about principles. Uh, you've read my book, The Principles of Effortless Power. 
That's some place you can look. Have you read the new book, uh, The Art of Mastery? I have it on my Kindle, and I've looked a little bit at it, but I haven't read the whole yeah. thing. All right, no worries. All right, yeah, see, and that that goes into principles a bunch. I give away the store in that book, again, because I'm an old guy, and I'm going to die pretty soon. So there's no reason for me to hold back or to, to, to fool people or to try to sell a bill of goods, which, unfortunately, most teachers are. So, yeah, you know, hopefully it's a good bill of goods, right? And it's a lot of fun, but still, you know, it's not my job. In any case, you talk about experience. To experience something, to be able to do it, and, you know, we're talking about martial stuff here, right? So, you know, or Tai Chi or Xing, whatever your people do. Um, um, yeah, you sent me something about what they do. So in any case, uh, the intellect isn't good enough. And the vast majority of stuff, um, everything we learn is, starts from the intellect, right? Somebody says something to you, right? You go to a, a Tai Chi class or Xing or Bakwa class or Qigong class or whatever. Go to a Zen class, I don't know. You go to a class and somebody says something to you or whatever. You read something in the book or you try to figure something out yourself. But somebody says that. And then, so it's intellectual, you see. And you go, oh, okay, I hear that. That's not good enough. See, not, not to do it. Like when a teacher used to ask me, and I studied with a lot of really great teachers. I studied pretty, you know, yeah. In any case, um, when a teacher would ask me, they would explain something and say, do you understand if I couldn't do it, I'd say no. Okay. Now, I didn't want to be a pain in the ass. That just kind of comes with my personality. <laughs> but you see, I knew I was missing something because of my huge background in the martial world and stuff, you know, being able to do stuff. And so when some, well, I'm talking about a little more advanced things, right? Here. And um, so if I couldn't do it, I knew I was missing something. See? And most people figure, well, I understand what you're saying, but they can't do it. So then you don't understand what they're saying, which is to say you don't experience what they're saying. There's something really critical missing in your experience. You know, and I talk, as you probably well know, I talk about, say, for example, um, you could, I could tell you about how to use effortless power. It's not easy. It's not easy because it is absolutely not normal for any human being to be able to do that, okay? But I could tell you quite candidly exactly how to do it. And if you could recreate everything I tell you and do exactly what I tell you, you could do it. You could do it. And uh, yet, you know, probably you can't. You know, most people can't. See, so I, but I could write an encyclopedia and you could read it and study every detail in the encyclopedia of, you know, effortless power. Can you do it? No. Because you see, the intellect isn't what's going to get the job done. It's your more reptilian brain, your nervous system. Your body is going to get the job done. You see, um, there's more to it than that. But anyway, see, that's what's going to get the job done. Getting a job done is going to get the job done. What you think about it is irrelevant. You see, and so you have to be able to move, to translate, to move from all that intellectual knowledge into something experiential. Then it becomes powerful. And a little experience goes a long way if it's powerful. But, you know, I have to tell you, I mean, I will show something to somebody and I'll say, okay, look, this is leading. And uh, now in this technique, now apply it to everything. And nobody's ever done that. I don't know why, because that seems to me the foundation of being a good student, okay, is to be able to take something in one form and expand a principle to fit every form of fighting, say, that you're going to do. Uh, and then, you know, you get some feedback when you're fighting that's one of the nice things but you talk about meditation people do contemplation meditation that's all they do but again where is that happening mostly their mind it's happening in intellect they're sitting there and doing something yeah hopefully they're doing something you know useful or healthy but so they're doing something with their mind okay but they got no feedback except the boredom they feel or the dissatisfaction or the whatever something might come up as a reaction or the pain of sitting for a long time, whatever it is, right? That stuff might come up, but they don't have any feedback about the reality. So they have an insight or something or they go, oh, oh, I bet the, you know, the universe is all one and everything like that. Good. Now, apply that. Well, how, how, is that, how do I do that? You know, see? They got no feedback, you see? 
you know, or, oh, I am at bliss and and I have, you know, I've calmed my mind. It's like one of the, one of the guys I used to play with, uh, um, Robert Nado, right? And Aikido, he's, uh, anyway, he's an old guy too. <laughs> and a long time ago, we used to do, he's an Aikido guy. And so people get his, he going to calm mind and stuff like that. One person was saying, yes, my mind is so calm and kind. He went up, slapped him in the face. Okay. Slapped him in the face. And they were like, you know, upset. And he says, well, how come your mind is calm? See, then that's feedback. All right. You know, I appreciate it because of, again, uh, my background. It's like, yes, you get some feedback and you go, oh, maybe my mind fantasy isn't real. They, maybe this being calm business, I'm just making it up and I'm putting myself into a state that I can do when there's, you know, a babbling brook <laughs> and the butterflies. <laughs> and I can do that state. But you slap me in the face, that state goes away. See, I get into battle and that state's gone. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, so the feedback of the marshal really helps, I think, in the meditation domain. Not that they're the same thing at all, they, but it helps know that, oh, I see, I'm just going down a fantasy road. I'm just going down an intellectual road. I see, I need some real feedback. When I was in the world tournament, um, the it was a, a cement floor, and on top of the cement floor was a uh, straw, just like a thin layer of straw on a cement floor. And, and you could throw people, so you get right down to that cement real fast. So in any case, thin layer of straw, and then over that canvas, right? And then we had these, uh, you know, little shoes, slippers on. And at one point, the canvas got, what do you say, fold, fold in it, you know, like it buckled. And I was backing up, I was moving around, you know, dancing. And my shoe came off. So the referee stopped the fight. So I could put my shoe back on. Now, one of the things uh, about good fighting is balance. One, there's many, many, but one is balance. People don't appreciate the balance uh, factor as how important it is when you're fighting. Because usually their minds are occupied <laughs> with something else. In any case, I use that opportunity to walk slowly over, pick up my shoe, hold it in my hand, lift up my foot, stand on one foot for a little bit, and then slowly put the shoe on, check, am I calm? Am I balanced? Am I centered? Yes. Well, my opponent is standing right there waiting, you see? And then I put my foot down and we go again. I just use it as an opportunity, you see, to see, to check, to have a little check there, and it worked out well. But that's part of knowing the difference, you see, between experience and intellectual knowledge or fantasy or beliefs. See, in the fighting domain, beliefs don't make a difference, no matter what you believe. There are a lot of people, anyway, okay, that's enough. <laughs> How's that? So this, well, what, what it brings to mind is that it seems like a lot of the time, maybe even myself included, people have um, this idea about how they experience reality or how they have an enlightenment experience. And they tend to view it as a static phenomenon. But what, what you say is that any time that you're having a direct experience, it has to be something where you could have feedback within that direct experience that wouldn't cause you to, it's even, it's a little bit even hard to put this into words, but it wouldn't cause you to either leave the direct experience or it wouldn't cause a cognitive change in you that would change the preconditions of, of your goal. And so I'm, I'm wondering if I'm not too far off the off, off track with that, then my next question is, when you say- um, Well, before we go to your next question, yeah. Okay, sure. You are you are too far off <laughs> track. Okay. Okay. So, so, you know, so we just create a foundation. There. You um you you brought in enlightenment into the conversation. Now every other part of the conversation, you know, like you could talk about a direct experience and experience like we're talking about about a principle, et cetera, et cetera. That's fine, but enlightenment is not that. And so when you bring enlightenment in, it's off the table. Okay, see, so we can't speak about it that way. There's no way you can understand enlightenment. It's not going to happen. There's nothing you can figure out. There's no technique you can develop, nothing. It's just off the table for discussion of these things. 
and it's off the table for discussion in the martial arts. So that being the case, see, because that's a direct consciousness of the true absolute nature of something. You, for example, you see, that has nothing to do with it. But see, now say you did, say you, you had, a, but kind of relating to your, I think, kind of what your concern is. Say you have an enlightenment and you get the your true nature. Cool. And you realize, say, now don't, again, I'm going to say some stuff, but don't believe me, okay? I hate beliefs. Um, you realize, you know, it's nothing, it's, it's off the table, okay, for a discussion, blah, blah. You know, it's completely out of experience. It's not a perception. It's not an experience at all. There is no experience. It's the absolute nature of existence. It's not an experience of. It's, you're not having a perception of. You're not having an experience of. It is it. Otherwise, it's not enlightened. You see? So anyway, so I don't want to go down that road too much. That's a whole other domain. But yes, you can't be shaken from it. So that means no matter what experience arises, it has no impact on your, say, experience of what you are. You know, your consciousness of what you are. No impact at all. It doesn't make any difference. You could be dying. It doesn't make a difference. Okay. You could be, you know, the world could be crumbling around you. It doesn't make a difference. You say you could have beauty all around. Still doesn't make any difference. You might notice the world's crumbling. You might notice, hey, there's some beauty or something like that, but it makes no difference to the enlightenment thing. So now also when the principles, yes, if you stay in the principle, of course, if you lose the principle, then of course. You're lost. So anyway, so that's some feedback on that, how you frame that. So go ahead and ask your question. So then when you're performing an activity where you're trying to be in the experience of that activity in order to perform it uh, in a more effective way, then the the way that you're going to be stimulated by um, outside phenomenon is going to have an effect on what your options are when you're performing the activity. So let me make it less cognitive. Um, if somebody is throwing a punch at you and then at the last minute, let's say it's a jab and at the, at the last minute, then what you, what you might think they were going to do in, in your cognitive environment, let's say they're going to throw a cross next, then they suddenly change and they do something totally different. Then the direct experience you're having when you're fighting with them how is it that you receive that information? Um, and because a lot of people will react instinctively to something, but I get the sense that what you're talking about isn't an instinctive reaction in an, in an untrained sense. It's an instinctive reaction where you have the ability at the same time to actually see what's happening and to integrate it into then your experience of, of <clears throat> performing fighting with them, let's say. Yeah. Now, let, let me expand then in our relationship to principles and your example. Um, see, in your example and the way you're thinking and the way 99.9% .9 of the people listening are going to be thinking is that you observe something like, okay, they're throwing a punch and, oh, they're doing something unexpected or they're throwing across whatever it is. And then you respond to it. In this case, you're sort of behind the curve, aren't you? See, and then you're dependent on your response to perceived stimuli, right? See, so you you see their body moving. See now, first of all, let's get ahead of the curve a little bit here before I even introduce the principle. See, so say they have a body and a mind, and they're going to do something, and they cannot throw a punch, any punch. I don't care what kind of punch. They can't throw a punch unless they start doing stuff with their body. You follow? See how they move their feet, their center, their weight, the distance, covering the distance, change, whatever. Changes have to occur. You see, in order, because this is a process, it's a process. And so for the order to throw a punch, they have to, their body has to start doing stuff. So again, not being behind the curve, you see these things. You notice these things. You feel these things because you're in touch with them. You see. And so long before any punch is launched, you're already there. And you know what's coming, so to speak, you see? Or at least you know the ballpark about what's coming, even if they're going to do something unexpected. They still have to use their body. <laughs> and they have to use their mind and their intent. And you're paying real attention 
and you're locked into their mind and intent, they can't hide anything. They're going to do what they're going to do, and it's going to happen through their mind and body. So again, so you're not behind the curve. You're not just sitting there waiting to see a punch come and then react to it. Okay? That's way, way, way be, uh, down the line. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so much better than everybody else when it comes to fighting, because most people do it that way. You know, they wait until the punch is coming at their head before they even start noticing and thinking, well, how do I react to this? Or what do I do with this? Which is dumb, all right? That's very pedestrian thinking. In any case, so now we have a different setup. We're in front of the curve behind, instead of uh, behind it. Now, say you're operating out of a principle, like leading or cutting or joining, whatever. Right? So now, if the principle is an operation, that's a principle of relationship. The principle doesn't occur by itself. It doesn't live in uh, principle land. It doesn't live as an idea. It doesn't live somewhere else. The principle happens only because you're relating that way, governed by the principle. So say you're leading somebody. Again, the moment they begin to move, you start leading them. You, again, you don't have to wait for the damn punch. You start leading. You lead where they're stepping. You need their angle, et cetera. They start to punch. You start leading that punch. And that's already in there. You understand what I'm saying? See, it's already there. If you really grasp the principle of it's really happening, it's happening because you're doing it. You're not waiting for something to happen and then you suddenly try to do a principle. No, the principle has to be active the whole time, all the time. You see, you're immersed in it. You're dominated by it. You're a slave to it, you see? And so that when they start throwing the punch, you're leading that punch, boom, boom, boom. And you move, but take advantage, whatever. So that's a little different. How's that? profoundly educational and frustrating at the same time. Um, now, with that in mind, then one of the major tropes that you see in the internal martial arts community is that people are really into this idea of internal and external unity. But it kind of seems like that nobody really explains how it works. And I think one of the advantages of, of Cheng Shin is that um, you try to really illustrate at a, a very foundational level, the basics of how how these things work relative to um, oneself, relative to another person or, or whatever you're working with. And then after that, start layering in, uh, let's say things that accord to those principles. But this is something that it's not just, uh, it's not just an idea, as you say. And so you, in in your own history, you have uh, one of the ways that you differentiated yourself. I think uh, one thing that was really helpful to get people interested in what you were doing was winning a full contact tournament uh, in Asia. But then uh, also you have had some pretty uh, excellent students as well. And so I'm wondering if you can share with us a little bit about uh, your experience as a teacher working with people who are who are learning this approach to doing things and uh how how people are able to work with the with the material and whether they whether you see them manifesting changes in themselves as a result yeah sure of course they 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 do otherwise they're not very good teachers but um you know it, it might they might fall short you see in some areas but of course they're able to apply it like once i was teaching in corpus christi and I had about i don't know 32 people i think and uh, I was trying to teach the offering and leading at the, as a principal, right? And get people to do it. Out of all the people in the room, I mean, I had same explanation, same demonstration, same thing, only one person got it. And how do I know one person got it? Because he was doing it. See? I can, well, I'm, I'm not an idiot. <laughs> I look out and I see everybody doing and trying and they're all in their heads or whatever and they're trying something. And one guy is actually doing it. He actually listened to what I was saying. You see, and he actually incorporated it and did it like an experience. So, you know, and he can teach that, for example. Um, you know, I've had lots of teachers and they uh, they work hard. You know, they get what they get. It's a lot to learn in Changshin. I mean, it's a it's a big field. But, you know, kind of something occurs to me. I do, as you said, consciousness work. And also the martial stuff. 
and the consciousness work, I have consciousness apprentices. And they'll stay here for like eight months. They'll live here on the land that, that I have here. And uh, we have a whole center here. And where we do retreats and everything for your people if they want to come. Anyway, we do these things here. And they come, the apprentices come and stay for eight months. And I work with them. Now, in the consciousness domain, we work a lot of contemplation, a lot of confrontation. That's Those are two different words, contemplation and confrontation. <laughs> they might have sounded the same. So anyway, a lot of mind stuff, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Discipline and whatnot. But I also throw in a physical component because I don't want them to be just, well, without feedback and you know just in their head, for example. So we do also, once a week, we'll do some physical consciousness where I get them into their bodies, we do body being work, and I also teach them effortless power. Now, why teach them effortless power? It's useless to them if they're not going to use it in any a particular way. It's a learning thing. See? I'm watching how they learn and listen and experience and how they listen. That makes a huge difference. See, how they listen. When I was young, let me do a little sidebar here. When I was younger and I studied in, the, in Judo and then in the Gong Fu's and things like that, see, I developed this ability, maybe because that mind stuff I talked about earlier, but I developed an ability to watch the teacher, listen to the teacher, and then experience what the teacher was doing, what they were doing with their bodies, what they were doing with their minds, even how they perceive the world, reality, as best I could, you see? And from that, I could do a lot, right? I remember one guy came in, he did a technique I'd never seen before, judo technique I'd never seen before. Yeah. And he's teaching, a, a, a guest te a teacher. And he did the technique, and I watched, and I did this. I was a black belt, okay, so I wasn't like, you know, a newbie. But I watched the technique, and I felt everything he did, the tension in the hands, the twisting of the gi, the movement of his body, the kneeling, the ducking, the twist, you know, everything he did with his body in relationship to the other body. I felt it like I was in his body, you see? And then I went up, did the technique right away, first time, boom, perfectly. Why? Because I did that. See, if you just watch, for example, it's a good learning. Uh, I teach my students this, right, how to learn. This is one thing, yeah, about learning, see? Don't just watch like you're an audience or you're listening and agreeing or anything like that. That's bullshit. Watch like you're actually the person doing it. If they're doing well, <laughs> you know, if they're really bad, then, <laughs> then just watch like an audience, perhaps. <laughs> but, you know, if you're trying to learn something, you see, and do it, put yourself inside them. So in any case, go back to my first thing. So about being able to listen in that way, because you see, when I do a lot of consciousness, I talk to them a lot, et cetera, about minds and experience and all that they're doing. And uh, we work with that. I want them to transform as a person. And that's very difficult. You know, I don't want them just to adopt a belief system and carry it around. That's useless. So how they listen is very important. So uh, toward that end, I teach them an effortless push. Right? Push like Tai Chi. And effortless push. And you know, to date, because I had martial apprentices, I teach the martial stuff. To date, the consciousness apprentice people learned effortless power much faster than any martial person I've ever tried to teach. Why is that, you think? The martial person you think have more invested. That's the problem. You see, they have too much fucking martial in their brain. They have traditions in their brain. They have goals in their brains. They have, you know, what they're trying to accomplish, and that it should be martial. You see, the conscious guys don't have that. They don't have that. They can give a shit right, about that stuff. They've got, I'm going to learn this. That's my whole goal. I'm going to translate what he's saying into reality. And then I you know, get feedback and boom, boom, boom. And they do it much faster than any person in the martial domain. So I forgot your, your, your questions. Uh, how are we doing <laughs> on this conversation so far? Yeah, good. Um, so I'd like to ask one more question before we start wrapping it up which is relevant to, to what you just talked about. One of the th things that um, at least happens to me, I either can't speak for anybody else, but I suspect it's also the case with most other people, is that when uh, interacting with 
people or things in the environment or, or phenomena around us, there's always a tendency for feelings to come up uh, in the process of interaction. And if I sort of cage it into martial arts, it might be easier to, to phrase this question. But um, when, when having a martial arts encounter, there's always some sort of um, emotional feeling, which has a psychological and physical effect, as well as just physical sensations that come up. And it seems like a lot of the time people use that to guide their uh, their intention or their focus or the way that they set up the their interaction. But it seems to me like, uh, although you can't separate feeling from experience, that there's different ways to become skillful relative to how you feel internally in relation to how you're experiencing something externally and this is one of my big questions is how to make it so that the feeling let's say an emotional feeling especially doesn't stop me or you know, our listeners from being effective in a physical engagement yeah sure <clears throat> sure um first of all don't have it you know you're the what <laughs> I, I can't not have it, is it? Yeah, you can. Again, part of that's the mind. The consciousness. Well, all of that's the mind. I'm just saying. Say, learning how to control your mind. You know, most people have really, really bad mind control. Even people who fight, you know, or or do little games or whatever it is, you know, or just the social engagement. Come on. <laughs> you know, you have reactions come up. I remember when I was a um, young man, I was fighting a lot, training a lot, and um, I didn't want to be hit, you know, we say we're doing striking, and I didn't want to get hit ever, and so I kept working toward that goal of never getting hit. I remember the one day I was in a well, place, doesn't matter, and training with some guys, and then uh, out of, say, like 100 blows thrown at me, two, three would hit me and upset me. And I started to notice that I was afraid of getting hit. And I was not afraid physically because they weren't hitting that hard, you know, and I didn't really care. I was afraid egoically. Say, so I was afraid that uh, of, of failure in my uh, quest say, to master not getting hit. And that fear was always there, you know. And so I dropped the fear. I wasn't afraid anymore. I wasn't afraid to get hit. I wasn't afraid how I looked. You know, I wasn't afraid of the outcome. I wasn't afraid of getting hurt, whatever. I wasn't afraid of anything like that. And that was the first time nobody could hit me. And I opened up so much, it was obvious. Ah, see, the relationship, the experience of the relationship, the movement and the feeling, not emotion, not reaction, feeling sense of the relationship happening that's how come i can make a miss every time you see is staying with that being aware of that see so getting that emotion out of the way obviously was a huge thing in that mastery and um <clears throat> people have a hard time when it comes to fighting see most of the time like i'm sure probably all of your listeners out of all of your listeners the likelihood that any of them are actual fighters is very small okay because people, that's it's a it's a rough business, and yeah, who wants to do that? In any case, but I have fighting, real fighting, is not a social domain. It is not a social encounter. So if you have emotions coming up, you have social interactions where emotions come up all the time, reactions come up, all kinds of feelings come up. It's it, 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 they're inappropriate. See, when you're actually fighting, you go blank in that domain. You're calm, present, and the whole emotional reactivity domain is set aside. It's, it's not appropriate. See, you don't get upset. You don't get afraid. You don't get angry. You don't, none of it. You know, worried, none of it. All that's gone. And all that's happening is the interaction, the relationship, and you're devoted to that without any of the other stuff happening. You see? That's what happens. That's what you should do with the feelings. Now, if you have a feeling come up, well, 
And there's not say say you you find an inability to get rid of it. Say oh oh I'm not calm anymore. Okay, okay. Then just let it float and ignore it. Oh, as a fit. So what? Shut up. You know, it's like take a back seat. I'm busy here. I'll get back to you later. Okay. <laughs> you know, just set it aside. You know, like 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 carrots floating in the soup. You know, <laughs> whatever uh, broccoli and the potatoes. Whatever. You know, it's just stuff. You know, then concentrate on the soup. You know, not the stuff. That you can't seem to get rid of. So anyway, how's that on the feeling domain? I think that it's pretty clear. So thank you. This has been a very interesting experience for me, and doubtless also will be for our listeners. Um, what we'll do is we'll we'll make sure that uh, when this comes out, we'll include your uh, website information. But uh, before we close, is there anything? that you would like to promote right now? For instance, you have a new book um, or any events that you have, feel free to uh, put your put your promotion in uh, now. Okay. Um, the Yeah, the new book, The Art of Mastery, has come out just a little while ago. If you're interested in that, it's a serious study. You know, I, I don't try to blow smoke up people's chimneys. You know, it's a serious study. If you really want to master something, um, the, the book can help a lot, especially in the martial domain, you know. Because that's where I glean most of my, uh, you know, information from. So there's that. But the, Peter Ralston, that's my name, Peter Ralston. Just go to PeterRalston.com and you can find out all kinds of stuff we're doing. And consciousness work, we do that in the fall and the spring. And we do some great work. And it really makes a difference. Even if you're just interested in, you know, like my assistant, Brendan, you know, he came to me at 17 years old. Now he's 39. <laughs> it have been a long time. See, he came... He was interested in the martial. That's all he was in. This young guy interested in the martial. But I did conscious work. So he did it, kind of got into it and stuff. But it wasn't until it took. And when it took, his martial got much better. Thing. When he started actually making breakthroughs, actually realizing the power of that work, this martial become much, much better. In any case, um, we're going to do martial stuff and body being stuff in the winter. We're going to create, we created a new winter winter retreat, January, February, in that time there. And we'll do uh, body being, that the body work, you know, body consciousness and stuff like that. Really powerful stuff that is foundational for any physical thing you want to do. And, you know, we could read you know, Zen Body Being. That's another book. Same basic kind of stuff. And uh, The Art of Effortless Power, Striking Arts, Boxing, that kind of stuff. Some more. So that's in the winter. So anyway, yeah. Just check it out, you know, check it out, whatever you're interested in, you know, take a look. I would, uh, if I were a martial artist and I really wanted to get good at what I was doing, I would listen to me, <laughs> okay? I really would, okay? So there's that. Thank you very much, Peter Ralston. You're welcome.